I just want to tell you that what I'm about to, to show is actually it's pretty disturbing. So if people like are queasy about ultra violence, you may want to look down for a minute or look away for a second, and then I'll tell you when it's okay to look back. But there's just one slide that's extremely disturbing. So just keep that in mind. I want to give you fair warning. So So on top of the indignity of being a refugee, of immigrating to Israel, and everything that implies, sadly, many of these African refugees were victimized on their way there before they even entered the country. In their efforts to acquire asylum, you know, they paid human traffickers, or they were forced to pay human traffickers in order to get them there. Some of them were outright kidnapped by human traffickers and didn't even intend to get to Israel. But the point is, a large amount of those African refugees in Israel were severely tortured before they ever got there by Bedouin crime families in the Sinai Desert. Human traffickers who, on top of the usual tortures, you can imagine the beatings and the rapes and the gang rapes and the electrocutions, they also invented a new kind of torture where they take plastic bags and burn them and then drip them on people's bodies. So I'm sorry to have to show you that, but I thought it was important that you understand the level of suffering that these people got to even before they ever entered. The minute they got to Israel, we should have washed their feet and made a, a, a bedding for them and give them every, um, every privilege possible. But that's not what they faced. They were dumped on the streets of Tel Aviv. Now, once Netanyahu builds that wall in 2013, as bad as it was, things start to get worse. For a time, they got extremely bad. So bad that hundreds of African refugees just went missing. To this day, the Israeli government says, we don't know what happened to about 500 of these Eritrean refugees. They're just, and I don't need to explain to you that the Israeli government has, is, is quite capable of keeping track. This is, it's, you know, known for its security prowess, right? So uh, it's, it's not that they somehow slipped through the cracks. All of a sudden, 500 or so refugees went missing, hundreds went missing. Where did they go? Till this day, no Israeli journalist besides myself even took the time to look into it and find out what happened. I'm sad to say I did find out what happened, and it's a sad story that I wish I didn't have to tell you. What happened was, when people started going missing, you see signs going up. Posters, people putting up posters in Tel Aviv and on Facebook saying, our family members are missing, our friends are vanished, where are they? Has anyone seen anyone? Please report it to so and so. So, no one knew where they went. One of these people I was able to track down. And what, his name was Ablel. Now, Ablel, um, like many of the Eritrean refugees who came to Israel, you know, went through a very difficult journey to get there. And of course, once he got there, it was challenging to say the least. But like many refugees, he worked as hard as he could. He labored away and eventually he was able to, you know, make, improve his life. And he was actually able to rent out a place and start a restaurant, an Eritrean restaurant in downtown Tel Aviv, to his credit. So, you know, working away, he managed to, um, uh, you know, improve his own life. And I only wish that this could have been the story of all Eritrean immigrants to the country. that They could have just integrated into society and become respectable, contributing members of Israeli society. Sadly, one day, he, uh, he has to go to the bank, you know, to, to uh, deposit the money that he got from the restaurant. And he's literally steps away from the American embassy in Tel Aviv, or I guess what was formerly the American embassy of Tel Aviv, now that the American embassy has been moved to Jerusalem, it is no longer, ha this building doesn't have embassy status anymore. But what for decades was the American embassy in Tel Aviv, he literally steps away from there and he has to take a cab back to get to his restaurant, he steps into a taxi and boom, he's beaten and drugged and driven down to the desert and thrown into a ditch. And then in the dead of night, he's taken to the border. 
that brand new border fence Netanyahu is so proud of? Well, you know, it certainly stops most refugees from, you know, climbing over and entering Israel, but it doesn't stop smugglers who are quite capable of figuring out the ins and outs and, and realizing how to get around it. And so we started to see the beginnings of uh, uh, slave trading in Israel itself, um, where folks like Ablel were whisked off the streets of Tel Aviv in midday, taken to the border and sold from one group to another. And then those Egyptian criminals took him, threw him in one of those um, metal containers, those shipping containers, and held him there with other Eritrean refugees, tied them together and tortured them again. After all the tortures that they experienced on their way to Israel, then they don't even have security on the streets of Tel Aviv. You see folks being kidnapped off the streets of Tel Aviv, dragged down to the desert, crossing back into Egypt, and being tortured there. Again, I'm going to show one of these disgusting photos. But this is the reality. It's important that you understand how deep it gets. Now, after several months more of torture um, that no one knows about and no one cares about, this is how little black lives matter in Tel Aviv that you can be kidnapped off the street in broad daylight. So eventually after several months, he, you know, he has to go to the, he, you know, they take him out to make a phone call because how do they make their money from these tortures? They, they torture you and they call your relatives on the phone in order to, you know, say, please help me send money to this account. And you know, in that way, they, they hope to extort money from these, these pitiful refugees. And so on one of these occasions when they brought him out to make a phone call to call his relatives, he managed to you know, run away, slip away. The person chasing after him tripped and fell and he actually managed to make it to the road you know, with much effort. So a very, very long, arduous journey that would be too complicated to explain right now, but he managed to make it you know, after great struggle to Northern Africa, to the Libyan coast, barely evades ISIS at this time. ISIS is in full effect. And in fact, they started executing Eritrean refugees at this time. Uh, some of these Eritrean refugees who had been living in Israel and who were forced out of Israel because they weren't Jews, then by the time they got to the northern Libyan coast to try to get to Europe, they're now kidnapped by ISIS and murdered for not being Muslims. So this is, Ablel may have been the first person to go through this disgusting journey, but he certainly was not the last. I'm happy to say there's a, a bright side to the story. Ablel himself finally made it past ISIS, managed to make it across the Mediterranean, made it into Switzerland, and thankfully he was able to get refugee status there because of course he damn well deserves it. And he married a, another Eritrean refugee and they have a child now and I'm, I'm happy to report he's starting a new life, thankfully. But, <laughs> but unfortunately, back behind in Israel, the fate of the rest of the Eritrean refugees and the other African refugees, we can't say the same for them. Um, in Israel, the government just doesn't even look at your, at your ap refugee application. If you're applying for asylum, it just ignores almost all of the applications. And then if it even looks at your application, it just outright rejects 99 point whatever, whatever percent of them. So you, it's an infinitesimal, maybe a handful of refugees that have been granted status, but 99.9% .9 rejected outright.